some some analysis on their games, that sort of thing. Um, I can cover it in the press, kind of stuff like that. Some of these some of these outlets are out of business now. Too bad, <laughs> unfortunately. But that's the way the the industry goes sometimes. Um, and then um. You know, uh, the other thing that we got to worry about is um, my blog, which I write a blog for howtomarketagame.com. It's a weekly blog. I post some research that I have done on my own, uh, you know, talking to game developers. Every week there's something new. Um, I The newsletter is how you join it. That's how you get the new stuff. So it's howtomarketagame.com slash free. If you'd like to join as a, as a fun little extra, you get a free book. I did this thing where I said 60 mistakes I always see game developers make. It's a little quick book, quick read, 60 things. You know how long that's going to take. Um, so just take a look at this. Uh, you get the free book when you join the newsletter, howtomarketagame.com slash free. So that's that's what I do. So between consulting, doing my own research, um, and then posting it on my blog, that's, that's kind of what I do. So <laughs> that's where all this stuff comes from. And most of the data that you're going to see and analysis come from this and the stories that I hear from real developers making real games and hopefully making some real dollars. Um, I didn't know that the timing was going to happen, but what I do is I also run a con uh, a conference, a mini conference. It's all virtual and the, all the talks are recorded and you can watch them or you can watch them live. You can watch them at any time. Um, but it's going on like right now. Like I just gave my first talk yesterday. I have a new talk tomorrow about how to make a puzzle game with a developer who did a fantastic puzzle game, sold well. It's hard to sell well when you're a puzzle game. We'll get into that. Uh, but on Wednesday, they're going to give a little inter interview with me, and I'm going to be asking them, how do you make and market a puzzle game? Because I don't know. They're really smart about it. So um, lots of talks. That, that's just the first talk. We got lots of other talks. Um, uh, so uh, this is how you get there inside 2024. And then I made a special coupon just for you all. I'm giving you 10 bucks off because you all decided to, to hang out with me. So uh, just check it out there. Uh, this conference is called the Staying In Conference because you get to stay inside and still do this conference. You don't have to actually talk to people, which is so much good. That's so good, right? Okay. Let's talk about it. Why market? Why even market a game? What is it? Why are we doing this? Okay. Let me let me show you what, what, what we're doing with the genre, all this kind of stuff. Okay. So... A while ago, there was this uh, Steam Festival. Steam Festival, they happen all the time. This one was Spring Edition, one of the first ones. And um, I knew a guy, and he made a really cool game, And but it's a puzzle game. And we'll get into it, but puzzle games are very, 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 very hard to market on Steam because the puzzle audience just isn't on Steam. Steam players don't really like puzzle games, and we'll get into it. But he made a cool-looking puzzle game, but it's just not the right fit for Steam. But during this festival, here's what he did. He's a very smart guy, and he figured out a slight hack where he could pin his game permanently on the front page of the festival, just like pinned it right here. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. I'm not going to tell who you what it was, but he he got it up there. Okay, <laughs> so he had his puzzle game on the front page of Steam for a week. Okay, that's the visibility everybody always says. They want I want visibility. Well, this guy got it. Let me show you what happened. Okay. What I do is I do surveys with everybody who's like in one of these festivals. And I say, well, tell me how many impressions did your game get? And there's this game, the first one. These are all the games in my survey from that festival. And you can see his game, because he was pinned to the front page of Steam, was the number one game. Got the most impressions. And an impression just means they saw his capsule, which means they saw that thing. Uh, the, you know, like right there on the front page. If somebody's interested, they click the capsule and they go play the game or look at the Steam page. That's called a visit. So let's check out to see how many visits these games got. This is the exact same order of games. See, each bar is a game. Okay, each bar is a different game. His game is the first bar. I kept his game in the same location. He's still the first game. Notice the number of visits, much, much lower. Now, these other two bars, you see these other two red bars, those are games that are very liked by Steam. Traditional Steam genre, strategy games, that sort of thing. They had just as many, they had really good visits. You'll notice that his, because he's a weird puzzle game and puzzle games aren't very popular on Steam, nobody wanted to click his, his little capsule. Okay. And what this means is, it even if you got infinite visibility on your game, if it is not the right type of game, 
it doesn't matter because the Steam audience has a preference. There are certain games they like and certain games they don't. So it is more critical than getting visibility. It is more critical to get the right genre. Notice some of these games that weren't even on that front page pinned like he did had more visits than him, even though he pulled this nasty little trick to get on the front page of Steam. Genre really matters. You can make a really fun game, but if the Steam players don't like that type of game, they will not buy it. No matter how cool it is, no matter how many weird tricks you do, genre is the most important thing, okay? So here's why we market, by the way. So I like to think of it, this is my game. I made a game a while ago. It's a platformer, not the most popular genre. Um, when you market a game, you are just increasing the visibility by a multiple, okay? All right, this is how I like to think of what marketing is. So when you're doing marketing, you're just lifting it up. You're giving it more visibility. And then when you launch, it's kind of like, I kind of like to think launching your game is kind of like throwing a paper airplane. You know, you like take it and you launch it and you just throw it. And over time, the visibility of your game will change, okay? Now, if you have a good game that is the right genre and it's good graphics, all the kind of good stuff, it's like a feather. Some games are like a rock and it is super hard to lift. If you think about it, lifting a rock is like, oh, just, you know, it's like a really heavy rock. When your game is a rock, it's really hard to lift it. It's really hard to do that marketing. But if your game is in the right genre, right type of game, it's like a feather. You just pick it up and you give it a puff and it goes. And the same goes after launch. The rock, once you launch it, falls. It's like when you throw that paper airplane and it just goes crashing down to the ground. It's a rock. And some games are feathers and they just glide on the breeze and a slight little puff from some marketing, maybe a streamer plays it, the game goes way up and does more and better and it floats around and it doesn't sink. That's what it is. This is all marketing is, just lifting it up. So now people are like, well, if my game's a feather, why do I even have to market it? Well, remember, marketing is just lifting it up. So even if you have a feather game, it's loved by everyone, it's still better to lift it up as high as you can because then it's gonna sail further. It's just like if you were to throw an airplane on the ground versus go up 10 stories on the top of a building and throw it. They're both paper airplanes. They both glide through the air, but it's gonna go further when you start higher up, okay? So even if you have a great feather game, it's still better to market it and lift it up nice and high. That's why we market, okay? So basically marketing is just a multiplier. It can't make your game succeed if it's not going to. It's just basically like if your game's a zero, and you do seven times marketing, seven times zero is still zero. So, so we can't, marketing cannot convince somebody to like a game that they're not gonna like. All it does is expand the visibility of a game that somebody's gonna like, okay? I, I can't control minds. I do marketing, but I cannot like change somebody's mind. I can just make them aware of it, okay? So our goal today, and the reason I'm talking about genre, it's to identify the rocks versus the feathers before you spend five years, don't do five years of development, trying to make a rock versus a feather. Really, we want to make just feathers, but it's kind of hard to tell what's a rock versus a feather until you throw it. But I'm going to show you tricks and tips and how to identify based on my own research in the market, what is a rock versus a feather, okay? Now, the secret actually is just genre. That's the, <laughs> that's the easiest way to tell the difference between a rock and a feather. Um, and I'll tell you. So, Martin Scorsese, I love movies. I'm a, a kind of a movie buff, you could say, a little, little movie fan. Um, Martin Scorsese said 90% of directing is casting. And basically, like, it's all about the actors you pick, what kind of actors you put together, all that. That's, that's all directing is. Similarly, I think it's for games, 90% of success is the type of game. It's making the right genre, the right type of game for Steam. That's it. Marketing is actually a very thin thing. The traditional thing people think about marketing, like, oh, I tweeted, I put on TikTok, I made a YouTube video. That's that's like just a tiny bit of your success. Most of the success comes from the type of game you make, okay? So we're gonna talk about, that's why we're talking about genre. And I've done analysis where I looked at the median sales for different types of games. Uh, median platformer, if you do the analysis of all the games that have released on Steam, the median platformer, We'll make about 1200 bucks. 1200 bucks. 
one of the biggest genres is a colony sim. The median price is $44,000. That's a median revenue from a colony sim. So a colony sim makes 44 times what a platformer will. That is the magnitude of this, this decision that you make when you pick the genre. Now, a colony sim making $44,000, that's still not a lot. But remember, this is I'm looking at all the games on Steam, not just one. I'm looking at all the games on Steam, all of the uh, colony sims. What did they make? About $44,000 median. That's the middle, okay? Now, anytime I say, well, platformers don't do well, somebody always comes up, oh, what about this game? What about this game? What about Celeste? What about, you know, you'll always think of an example of one succeeding when they beat all odds, okay? But here's the thing is I've done analysis on the top 1%. So I looked at each genre and I looked just at the succeeding games. I said, for each genre, I'm going to pull just the 1%, just the 1% victory games, the games that made the most money. Even when you pick the winners out, you will notice that the winners of these genres do worse than these other genres, okay? And the genres that the top 1% that do so poorly is VR, visual novel, puzzle, puzzle platformer, local multiplayer, twin stick shooter, 3D platformer, 2D platformer, shoot 'em ups, and match three. Even if we pick the success stories out of those genres, they still do not do as well as these genres like open world survival craft, souls like city builder, RPG, FPS, simulation games. These genres do so much better. They do even when they succeed, they do better. That is what I need to teach you all is even if you come up with a story like, oh, I heard this game did very well. Yes, but it did well relative to other platformers, that sort of thing, okay? And here's the thing. If you play the lottery, every month, somebody's going to win the lottery. Somebody's going to win it. But I still don't recommend you play the lottery because it's a terrible bet. It's a terrible, the odds are terrible. But somebody still wins every single day in the lottery. That's what you have to kind of wrap your mind around. Yes, there are some success stories from some of these bad genres, but you have to think in aggregate. Think of the total amount, not survivorship bias, the total amount, okay? Now, the other thing you have to concern yourself with is this is the, a chart of the top 1% is at the top. Then I looked at the median, and I also looked at the bottom percentile, okay? And you'll see that there are some genres that are very narrow. The big ones are like, um, if we look at, uh, where is it? I can't find it in here. <laughs> it's in here. Um, like if you look at, I'm trying to find, oh, Battle Royale. Battle Royale is the big bad one. Battle Royale has a very, very long bar if we look at the 1% all the way to the bottom. And that's because typically Battle Royales have one succeeding game, maybe two. All the other games fail on Battle Royale because pe Battle Royales are very hard to, to specialize in. So players only like the two winners. They specialize either the main one or the second one. It's Coke or Pepsi, either one of those. Everybody else fails. And that's what this long bar means is the top 1% get very high. They do very well. But everybody else is very low. Look at how low the median is. That's this middle bar right here. That's the median. Whereas genres like um, roguelike deck builder, notice how their bar is very short. Very short bar. That means the top 1% do well, pretty good. Not as good as a as like a roguelike or a, as a, match, a battle royale. But the bottom is also much higher. And the median is much higher. So you have a better chance at succeeding if you make a roguelike deck builder because the highs are higher and the lows are higher too and the median's much higher than something crazy like a battle royale because battle royales are winner take all. One wins or none of them win, okay? So let's look at the top sellers on Steam. Now, what I do is I like to look at everybody who succeeded last year. I, every year I do this, I, I check in, I say, 2023, how are the games? And what I do is I look at just the games that earned a 1,000 reviews or more because that is success. Like, uh, there's nothing in the algorithm that says 1,000 reviews equals anything. There's not. It's just really, 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 really hard to get a 1,000 reviews on Steam. Okay, it just is. So I say, give me just the 1,000 games, and I will go hand by hand, identify the genre, see what type of game it is, watch the trailers, maybe play them. So I look at just the winners here to see what type of genres are breaking through, okay? And we'll find some things like narrative games actually do quite well. A lot of them will break through into this top earners thing. What this tells me is see how many narrative games there are? 
this means this is a very rich genre. There's a lot, these players play a lot of narrative games. And that means, look at how many there are. I think there were 20, 20 narrative games, which are like, you know, kind of like um, dating sims, these kind of like story-based choices matter type of games, dialogue choice games. 20 of them succeeded. It's a very vibrant genre. And then there are genres where it's just like one of them succeeds. For example, 4X is a very, it's a, it, it's a popular genre, but it's a very hard game to make. So there aren't that many that break through. Okay. Now, one thing that I like to do is I like to see, is this a good genre? And I look at, are there any publishers that specialize in that genre? If there are publishers that only make one type of genre or publish games in one type of genre, that means there's a lot of hunger in that community. That community really likes these games because they can fund a whole studio. They can fund a whole publisher just to make that type of genre. If it's a weird genre that only exists one time, then there probably isn't going to be a publisher for it. So if I look, notice horror games, Thread XP is a, is a horror publisher. They make a whole living of just publishing horror games. Um, Playway makes simulation games. Survival games, none yet. There's no publisher that makes survival games. That's an opportunity. If you're looking to become a publisher, I'd publish survival games, like open world survival craft, kind of like Valheim, those kind of games. Those are very hard. Those are very hard to make, but I think there's an opportunity for a publisher. So that's an open thing. I, I, I'm telling you, there's there's an open opportunity there. Uh, the other one is multiplayer shooters. There's not any. Nobody is making multiplayer shooters as a genre. I think that's because multiplayer genres are very hit or miss kind of like battle royale it's very hit or miss that's why you don't see many um then you have narrative there's a lot of them like whitehorn games and aperna interactive fellow traveler there's a lot of studios that specialize in narrative games and then if you go down um adult a little spicy there's mango party that specializes in adult games and then there's hooded horse which is one of my favorite publishers very smart people the hooded horse people are so smart whoops um they really are smart um and they make strategy games strategy games are very very popular on steam and they specialize just in strategy games okay so even if you were to find the perfect genre like i say you have to meet the expectations of that genre you can't just make something and say like well i'm making a first person shooter but i heard strategy games are so i'm just going to call my first person shooter a strategy shooter that's going to work right it will not. That will not work. It must appeal to those fans. You have to understand it. Now, one thing that fans like to do, they see my charts. A lot of people read my charts and they see the top two genres like horror and I don't know, like strategy game. And they're like, I'm going to make a horror strategy game. I'm going to mix the genres, double my revenue. That is not it's true. I actually recommend against mixing genres. I know it sounds strange. I know indies love to mix genres. I do not think mixing genres is a good idea. Let me show you why. Let me show you why. Okay. I looked at the hit games from 2022. And because there are only about 500 hit games that made 1,000 reviews, I just went line by line. I said, is this a genre mix? Is this this genre, this genre, you know, crisscrossing genres? I found only 11% of games that succeeded are actually a true genre mix. Most of them are just a straight up genre. They're just like, hey, we are a survival game, but we're on a boat. We're a survival game, but we're pirates, that sort of thing. Rarely do you find a game where it's like, oh, it's a rhythm game mixed with a dancing game mixed with a dating sim. You don't see that, <laughs> okay? Now, the reason is, this is my theory, there's this guy who designed a lot of products that we know, like the Coke bottle. The, you know, He really came up with that Coke design, and he had a saying called Maya, which is, his name's uh, Raymond Lowy, most advanced yet acceptable. That's what Maya stands for. Most advanced yet acceptable. And what his theory was is when he was designing these iconic products, you can't push it too far. You can't disrupt too much. You can change a little bit, not too much. Okay. And when people make these genre changes, when they say, we're going to mix this genre, this genre, it's too much. It's too much. It turns away fans. They're like, I don't even know what this is. This is too much. Okay. And if you think about the history of the iPhone, look at the history of the iPhone. These are all the iPhones lead, or all the iPods leading up to the iPhone. You'll notice very small incremental changes. It wasn't like they said this, 
to the iPhone. No, it was like this. And then they added a little bigger screen and then they added a click wheel and then they added a color screen and then a little bit bigger color screen and a little bigger and a little bigger. And then they went to the iPhone. It's very tiny changes over time. You don't just change everything right away. And one thing a lot of product people say is when you're making something new, you make one thing, 30, one third, exactly the same. Then you do one third an improvement, just like fixed a bug. You just fixed a bug. You fixed something that people were annoyed by. And then one third is some crazy new thing that you add. I don't know, like a radio or something like that. You can't just make 90% new. It's got to be a tiny change. And I think this is why indies hurt themselves with genre mixes. It's too new. It's too much. You, gotta, you can't change that much, okay? When I was looking at the top games of 2022 and I said, hey, only 11% actually were genre mixes, most of the improvements were the following. These are the ones that were not genre mixes. This is how they innovated within the game. This is what these succeeding games made. They were typically a game, but in a different environment. They were like the same game as a different game. They just changed the environment. It was like, oh, instead of being on the ocean, it's in the desert. Instead of being ancient Rome, it's ancient Egypt. You know, they just changed the setting. It was the same basic genre, but they just changed the setting. They took a game and they just made the graphics better. Or they took a 2D game and they made it 3D. Or they took a 3D game and they made it 2D. They turned it a single player game and they made it multiplayer. And then the other way, they made a multiplayer game single player. This is most of the innovations that happened at the most successful games at the top. They're just tiny changes. That's all most fans want. They're just like, I just want a tiny change. Okay. Now, I read this story. There's this really great article. I don't know if there's taco. Do you guys have Taco Bell in Hamburg? We have it. It's a taco shop. It's a, it's, it's the weirdest restaurant in, here in America. I don't know. I, 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 do do y'all have, uh, Margaret, do you have Taco Bell? Is no, yes actually no? not. I don't think they're in, in Germany at all, but not in Hamburg, oh, okay. definitely. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. So they make Mexican food and it's like very interesting Mexican food. We, we actually call it Tex-Mex here. That's a different story. If you ever come to Arizona, I'll teach you about Mexican food, like real Mexican food. Uh, Cause we got it. We, we, I'm in Arizona. We have a lot of it, but Taco Bell is still fun. Even though, uh, I love Mexican food. This is not real Mexican food, but I still eat there. It's still good. So uh, there's an article written by The New Yorker and just search this thing. Uh, Taco Bell's innovation uh, in the front lines and stunt for food wars. Basically, they, they really make really weird food and new. But what they did, this is they have a they have a food lab. They have scientists who invent new foods for this restaurant. OK, this is it, this restaurant is all over America, by the way. OK, so. What their principle was when they're inventing a new food is you can change either the taste or the form of the food, but you cannot change the taste and the form. That's how they innovate. That's how they make new foods. And uh, I created this graph here. Let me, let me, let me simplify it. So you can, what he said was you can either change the form of the food or you can change the taste. So if you, this is kind of the chart of change, okay? So if you wanted to change the form of it, you can make a new type of taco. What they did was they, they made, if you've had a taco, they took two different types of taco and they, and they folded them onto each other. Or they changed the form and they made this thing, it, it's called a crunch wrap and it, it, it's like origami. It looks like origami, but you eat it. But it's the same ingredients, the same flavors that you would have anywhere else. It's just beef, cheese, tomato, nothing too interesting. So the flavor is the same, but the shape of the food is very different. So they innovated along this way. Now, they could also innovate taste-wise. You can go this way. But if you notice, when they innovated on taste, they kept the form the same. So they made fries where the cheese is into the fries. But you'll notice the flavor is different. It's fries that taste like cheese. That's weird. But they kept the form. They just look like french fries. They didn't change the form. They just changed the flavor. Or they took a typical burrito, meat, cheese, and a burrito, and they changed the flavor. They made it hot. They made it popping chili. Like the chili explodes in your mouth. It's, it's crazy. So again, they changed the taste on this one, but not the form. They kept the same form of foods, French fries, burritos, tacos, nothing changed there. See how they changed the flavor or the form. If you try and change both, you end up in this. This is the danger zone. Don't change too much. You've changed too much. You are both in changing flavor and taste and shape. You can't, you do taste or shape. You can't do both, okay? And I think that's a lesson for games. The number of games that successfully changed a lot is very rare, okay? You can either change the flavor 
or the shape, but not both. And that's what I found when I looked at the, the hit games of the last years is mixing genres is not that common. So the why is this? It's because you have to respect genre trends, okay? All right? So here are the games, like narrative games. This is one of the most popular ones. You know how I said there's 20 games that hit 1,000 reviews in 2022? Well, I dove in. I looked at them. Turns out 50% of these games were horror games. It's kind of weird. Like they always had like some sort of demon or a witch or you're dating the devil or you just had horns on you. 50% of the narrative games had some sort of supernatural element. Okay. If you're making a narrative game, that fan base, that genre really likes spooky horror stuff. If you're trying to make a narrative game and they're not succeeding very well, throw some horns on somebody, make their eyes like demonized. Might increase sales. <laughs> it's just like for some reason that fan base just loves things a little spooky. So make make it a little spooky. Put some witches in there. Okay. Now there's this really good talk. Really good talk. It's on YouTube. Don't, you should watch it. After you watch my thing, close the browser. Watch this talk. This is a really good talk. This is from GDC last year. It's called Re Respecting Player Fantasies and Dating Sims. This woman writes for dating sims. She's basically just writes dating sims. And they have access to tons of data because her company um, is an online web portal where people can play dating sims. And they so they have like real-time data of what people want, what boyfriends people want to choose, which boys they want to date, which girls they want to date, whether they're dating a demon or something. So they have real-time data. It's a very good talk, very good talk. And what you learn about genre, you learn so much about genre, even though it's a dating sim, even if you're not making a dating sim, Watch this talk because you learn how precise genres must be. You cannot deviate from genres very much, okay? For instance, she gave this slide. When you're doing a dating game, players want to solve, they don't want to, um, they need a character. <laughs> okay, they want uh, characters to solve problems and they want characters that they're trying to date to pay attention to them because they don't want to be able to chase a boyfriend around in a virtual world. They want the boyfriend to come to them and be like, I love you. You have to have player consent before you have a sexual encounter. Um, you can do love triangles, but you have to tell about it. You have to broadcast it. These are these like invisible rules about dating sims. And you only learn these rules once you've made a bunch of these and you've talked to the fans. These are very important rules. Now, every genre, I know this, you might not be making a dating game, but every genre has rules similar to this. I mean, love triangles don't really matter in the world of like Factorio style games, but there's going to be something that is similar to those love triangles, okay? Um, and when I asked her about it, because I, I, this is my conference, you know, the conference that I was talking about? This was last year's, uh, I interview all my speakers. And this is what she said, this is Betty Robinson. She said, fans of the genre have very high expectations about what the beats are, what the tropes are. You have very strict rules. Players can react very strongly if you break the rules somehow and make them feel like you're insulting them, wasting their time, or not following conventions they want their romantic stories to be. You have to follow the rules of your genre. For instance, she was talking about uh, um, tr love triangles. If your story has a love triangle in it, you have to broadcast that right at the beginning. So Twilight, if you... A lot of a lot of big Twilight fans in the audience, I assume. Uh, Twilight is the first episode, the first movie, was just a, the pair, just the two of them dating each other, falling in love. So the poster said, oh, there's only two people. But the next one was a love triangle story because he's a werewolf. She was, she was possibly interested in a werewolf. And they broadcast it in the marketing. The marketing is very clear. It says, this is a love triangle. Here is the love triangle. And you can look at their gaze. Like, he is doubting her. He is looking at her. She is looking at the audience like, which one do I choose? See how the marketing broadcast. This is the type of story. There's no surprises. There's no surprises. It's the same thing. You have to set these genre expectations right up front. Like, this is what I am. This is the story. No surprises. I know. I'm telling you not to have surprises and to follow the rules. That sounds so lame, but that's what fans want. They really want it. So do not violate genre standards. AK anchors. This is a term I came up with. It's like kind of the rules that every genre has. They have some core rules that you cannot break and you have to learn them. 
This is for a visual novel. These are the rules of a visual novel. I highlight these are rule reviews from Steam. This is a game that's failed on Steam. And if you look at the reviews, you can see which rules this game violated. See, it says, this is a visual novel. It doesn't allow me to skip dialogue. A different review said, you'll have to wait through dialogue. And then this other review said, frustrated seeing there's no option to skip fast forward through dialogue. What did we learn? If you're making a dating sim, like a visual novel, you need to be able to skip past dialogue that you've already seen before. This is an anchor of this genre. You've got to learn the rules. Here's another anchor. <laughs> I'm really teaching you all about romance today. You didn't think that you were going to do it. If you're making a dating sim, you have to have this, what's called a CG, computer graphics. You have to show the protagonist kissing. You do. You just have to. That's a rule. If you don't do it, people will leave you bad reviews. Now, this does not apply. You don't have to show people kissing like if you're making a RTS or something. There's different rules, but you got to learn the rules. Um, you can see it. You can see it like this. This is a, a narrative game. You have to have choices. Look at these bad reviews. This is a game that did not succeed. And you can tell just looking at the reviews. I look at a lot of reviews. Nearly every choice I made felt irrelevant. Uh, this one down here says, um, the only interactivity in the dialogue choices had no effect on the story. The characters felt flat. It was becoming obvious that my choices didn't have meaning. See, these are all different reviews, but they kept circling the same core anchor of the genre. I need to make the choices in the story. If you just dictate the story and I don't get to make the choices, I'm going to review bomb you. That's an anchor. That's a rule of the genre. You have to learn the rules of your genre. Okay? So hooks, we all hear about hooks. That's what makes your game unique. But an anchor is what makes your game similar. And you need both. Your game needs both to be unique and it needs to be similar. It's a mix. Okay? So you must learn your audience and the genre. You can't just go crazy and like flip the genre on its head. You have to do slight adjustments. Do your homework. Play every game in that genre that you're making. Do your homework. Um, Deep Rock Galactic Survivors, huge hit. It's, a, it's not a dating sim. This is You don't get to date this guy. I know I've been talking a lot about dating sims. You don't date this, this uh, dwarf. Okay. Um, this is a great game. I just interviewed the creator of it. A co-creator that was a, it was a two studio collaboration. Soren Lungard, he had this quote. I asked him, like, it's a vampire survivors like the genre is vampire survivors like. And I said, how did you design the game? And he said, we started out by selecting some of the games from the genre we wanted to look at. We looked at one of the lesser known ones, some of the lesser known ones, Rogue Genesia. We looked at Army of Ruin, all these other ones. We picked some of these, played them, and talked about them. My main conclusion after playing 30 of them. He played 30 of them. Don't go complex on the controls. Most of the others are trying to mimic vampire survivors as much as they can, and they don't bring anything new. So after he studied the genre, he played 30 of them. This is the CEO. This guy's in charge, and he still was playing a bunch of them. You understood the, he understood the anchor of the genre, which is no, no, no complex controls. You just move a character around, and they do all the work. They do all the shooting and stuff. That is an anchor of the vampire survivor's likes. But he only realized that after he plays a ton of them, okay? And then he also realizes, hey, these other ones that su didn't succeed, they didn't improve the genre enough. They didn't, they didn't fix anything, okay? They didn't make any big improvements. So you've got to mix both the anchors and you have to bring something new. It's a mix. It's a mix. Here's another one, Spirit City Lo-Fi Sessions. I just wrote about this on my website. If you go to it, I wrote a whole document about this. This game sold about 40,000 copies in four days. Okay. This is, a, this is a hit. Okay. Now, this is a very strange genre. You may have not even known about it. Um, if you go on YouTube and you look, there's, uh, there's a whole series of YouTubes where they just play some like chill kind of music. It's kind of, kind of techno, a little bit, but it's very chill. And what you do is you just sit, you, you do this, and then you work to this music. But if you look at the images that they put on the YouTube channel, they're always like kind of these cartoony people in very cozy homes. And they're just chilling, doing some work, listening to some chill beats. Sometimes you're a raccoon, listen to chill beats. Okay, so they, this team that made this game studied this market of people who just want chill beats to, to work in their cozy house, right? 
So when they made their game, look what they did. They they incorporated this chill stuff, like sitting on your bed, working, being chill, sitting in the window with your cat, sitting in a window with a cat. Like they just studied what the market wanted and they built it. I know it sounds like, oh, you can't, you can't, you can't market test them. Oh, you can't market test this stuff. You guys you just gotta come over your head. It does not. You study the market, you look deep into it. You study how all these, what these people want, what they're doing, how are they spending their time? And you incorporate this. This game sold 40,000 copies in four days because they knew their audience. And then what you do in this game, Spirit City, is you just turn it on and just let it run. And while it's running, you just listen to some chill beats and it gives you points and you unlock little Pokemon style animals to hang out with you. And you get to redecorate your room. Hot genre, very hot genre. So I've talked a lot about all these genres, you know, all this kind of stuff. And a lot of people are like, well, what are the good genres? What genre should I make? All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you what are the good genres and what are the bad genres. Now, real talk, I'm gonna be honest. I'm gonna be honest what I think are the good genres and not. Now, you might be making one of the genres that I say are bad genres. Now, don't, don't lose heart. I made genres. I made games in genres that don't work, okay? And I'll just be honest, you'll get through it. It's not a death sentence. It's just tailor your expectations, tailor your development to the expectation that it is a very difficult genre. There, there are times when some of these genres that I say are bad, there are games that succeed. It's just dial it in as a risk factor. Say like, I don't expect much for this game because the genre is very hard. Or if you're... You're trying to market your game as hard as you can, and it's just not taking off. And you're like, what the heck is going on? I'm telling you this so that you're like, you know what? I think this is the genre. I think it's I think it's the genre. So I'm trying to tell you this stuff, and it's going to be real. I'm going to tell you the genres that don't really work. I'm doing this so you at least know what's kind of going on. You at least have an understanding of what's going on, okay? I'm going to be honest with you, though, because I love you, okay? In a platonic, non- uh, triangle romance type of way, totally platonically. Okay, so let's do this. So like I said, the genres, even if you look at the 1% success stories, the genres that don't succeed are VR, visual novel, puzzle, platformer, lost, local multiplayer, twin stick shooter, 3D platformer, 2D platformer, shoot em up, match three, okay? The reason I think is, and people underestimate this. I talk about Steam. Everything I talk about is Steam. If, you, if you're making a mobile game, I don't know. That's a different story. If you're making a PC switch, I don't know. That's a different story. I just talk about Steam. The progeny of Steam, the direct descendant, are from PC games. Classic PC games. When you had this like computer that looked like this, what a sweet setup this guy had. This is where Steam came from, okay? It is not the console market. Steam games are deep simulation like The Sims, Diablo, Civilization 2, Doom. These are like deep, like dark, grimy, simulation-y games. Console games, and I find a lot of indie devs kind of come from the console side, are not the same. Console games are more like cutesier, a lot more narrative, a lot more platformers. They're a lot more story-based, okay? And I'll show you. Linear character, narrative, approachable, polished puzzle games. Puzzle-based. Okay, those are the console games. Steam really is still a PC-centric place. It's changing a little bit, but not much. From like 20, 30 years. I used to play these games when I was 16 years old. I am not 16 anymore. But these games are still the same. The games were popular on PC back in the day. Sandbox, systems-driven, action-focused, narrative no, they don't. The type of games that are good on PC are sandboxy, system-focused, strategy, moddable, buildy, replayable, slightly janky, but this is the PC marketplace. And Steam carries through a lot of these rules. This has not changed. People are always like, oh, the market changes so fast. What's going to be big next year? These games have been like this for 16, since I was 16, like 30 years ago, okay? 30 years this has been the same case. And I have a feeling if something's been the same for 30 years, it's probably still going to be the same 30 years in the future. They don't change that much, okay? So these are the type of games that Steam players 
just don't like. They're, it's very hard to make one of these work. Okay, this is the genre list that I say is like very, 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 very hard to do well on Steam. Okay, and if you're if you feel like it's you're lifting a rock and you throw it and your game crashes, like not code wise but sales wise, it's probably one of these genres. These genres are very, very hard to do on Steam. Okay, and this is this is why a lot of people have trouble marketing these games. They're just genres that are very hard to make. Okay. I have, I'm, this is kind of soft data. This is my gut, what my gut tells me. This is, not, I can't tell you a chart for this, but my theory is, if you're wondering, is this a good game or not? If you control the main character, it's going to be hard to sell on Steam. I mean, that sounds weird. What, everybody, every that's video games. You control the main character. What I mean by that is if I pick up a controller and I push up, does my character move forward or does my character, you know, move when I push up on the controller or down? If I move this, am I moving the controller like the character when I go like this? Or do I move a cursor? In my kind of gut feel, after looking at games for decades, is Steam players do not like it or they're apathetic to it. I'll show, I'll, let me describe. When you move the control stick and you move the main character, there's, it's, I know it's not, it's not that people, nobody's going to express this. Nobody's like, oh, they move the controller. When I move the controller, I move the player. It's just the design implications of that cause uh, a lot of problems for indies. Let me show you. So that's what I mean. Games that you control, when you move the controller, you move the character. Like Mario and, and Legend of Zelda and Dark Souls and Uncharted. Now, you're going to say, well, Chris, all these are hit games on consoles. Now, Dark Souls is popular on PC, but, and this is why I say this is hard for indies. Remember, we're indies. I know these are both video games, but these are different types of games than what we make. We make a different, we can't, I, mean, I know you think you can, but we cannot make these games. These are games that are very hard. You need a team of like 100 people who are at the top of their game. Unfortunately, we indies are not there. So, one of the big reasons is it is very hard to make games where you control where you push up as soon as you start moving the controller like this and you move the character you multiply the the opportunity for jank and steam players will downvote you if your game is too janky you'll see these are bad reviews that i pull but there's enough jank to get on my nerves or look at this if you can get this game for cheap do it combat is challenging albeit a little janky at times janky they just hate it and it's so hard for us indies especially if you're a first time dev to make a game that is not janky i don't even I, I don't even know how to make a game not janky okay it's very 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 hard even though you think you can it takes years and years to make a game not janky when you control the main character okay it's it's very hard okay um the other one is when you control the main character you fly through content because when you control the main character by moving the stick, that guy is running through the environment. And when you run through that environment, content is just zipping by. And content is very expensive. It is very expensive to make content because you, you could draw, it takes hours and hours to draw a beautiful environment. But if you're pushing up on the control stick and that guy's just running right through the environment, boom, that hours and hours that you and your small team put together just went right by. That is why it is so risky to control the main character is because you just zip and buy the content there. Now, uh, and, uh, next one that I see a lot, a lot of indies make educational games. I don't know why they make them, but they do. Caution on educational games. Um, this is Mr. Rogers. He teaches kids in America how to like read and like be nice. Um, Steam, on the other hand, if I were just to picture the typical Steam player, this is kind of what I picture. Just like <laughs> dark, Grimy, like, come oh, on, I want to see some skulls. This is a typical Steam player. If you bring an educational game to Steam, it is like Mr. Rogers coming to a death metal concert and trying to teach kids in line to read. I This AI generated, I just typed in Mr. Rogers teaching metalheads how to read. I love how they generated this little kid that's just like, this little metalhead kid's just like, oh, I hate Mr. Rogers. This is what it's like when you try and release a Steam game that's educational. Steam audience, picture this when you picture the Steam audience. This is what they're like. They're like, what? I can't bash some skulls. This is what they want. This is what they want. Okay. 
Uh, another favorite guy. This guy taught me how to read. This is LeVar Burton. He's He does reading Rainbow. Also, it's like if you bring an educational game, like this is Steam. It's like fire skulls. Yeah. If you're, you're like trying to teach metalheads how to read, okay? <laughs> when you bring an educational game to Steam, it's the total wrong audience. The game just won't sell. I'm, I'm telling you, you're really like, you're like trying to teach these guys how to read. Would they like it? Probably not. Okay. <laughs> so I've just told you all these no's. Don't make the platformers. Don't make a game where you control. What kind of game doesn't allow you to control the main character when you move up on the control stick? How is that even possible? Let me explain. Okay, these are games that Steam likes, and these are mostly games where when you push up, you do not control the character. Mostly Rogue, Sandbox, Open World Survival Craft, Deck Builder, City Builder, Colony Sim, Simulation, 4X, and then Wholesome, Horror, and Visual Novel. Now, I know somebody's probably typing in the questions, but Chris, what about uh, th this game? Oh, th this game controls with the main character. Yes, there are a few in there when you push up. But for the most part, mostly in the City Builder, Simulation, 4X, this department right here, when you push up on the control stick or you push up on the mouse, you are moving a little cursor and that is telling them like, oh, place this brick here or place this building here or send more troops to this section. You are telling the game through a menu how to interact. And I find that indies can make games like that much better than they can make a game where you're a dude running through an environment and expensive content is zipping by you. It's just those genres are easier to make as us being small indie teams, okay? Now, there's there's a lot of caveats in there, but in general, when I think of Steam games that do well, it's crafty, buildy, simulation-y strategy games. This basically is the type of game that Steam likes. They just like it. They're good genres for first-time developers. Now, I'm going to walk through some actual genres that I think are very good, especially if you're a first-time developer. You may have never even heard of these genres because they're very small but very potent audiences. First one's Cozy Builders. No, I said, I know I said, seems like full of death metal. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, but there's also this whole cozy contingent. Maybe the metalheads are like, you know what, I like to do this, but I like to be cozy after, that, after I go to my concert. Um, so Cozy Builders are very big unpacking try these games out unpacking memento chill corner virtual cottage basically what you're doing is you're using a cursor to place cozy items in a cozy room and that's it that's what you're doing you're just making this room cozy um that's a lot of it what it is now i know this is a puzzle game unpacking is kind of a puzzle game you're like Chris, I know you said puzzle games don't we yeah but it's kind of they found this weird niche where it's like a puzzle game same thing with um this is also a puzzle game, um, Memento, where it's kind of puzzly, but you're still kind of building, buildy, puzzly. Those kind of work. Those kind of work. Um, another one is um, really is the one I just wrote about, Spirit City Lo-Fi Sessions. This is a idler incremental, and I'll talk about this. But it's also when you idle for a while, you get to build a little village, a little house. You get to pick what your cat looks like and what kind of things are on your head, whether you have horns or cool glasses, that kind of thing. That drives straight to the next genre, which is very good for first-time teams, and they're idler, incremental, plus that kind of genre. Um, example games that did very well, Micro Civilization, Chilquarium, Orb of Creation, Norp Apollo, I don't know how it's built. I, I just seen it. But what you're doing is you're just picking what things to upgrade, and then it idly adds incremental. It, People fight whether it's idler or incremental or passive game. There's all these different genres. Whatever you want to call it, you're right. You are right. I'm wrong. Um, but these type of games where the game kind of just increments little numbers and you build things, again, you're not controlling with the stick. You're just telling where in the menu to upgrade the things. Next one is simulation. Uh, these are like supermarket simulator, house flipper 2. Basically, they find a really boring job, and it's a simulator for that boring job. Not boring job. I mean... It's just a very, like, job job, you know? Um, and you're like, well, Chris, that one's controlled by the stick. Yeah, and I'm like, yes, you are correct. But you're kind of like you're a non-character avatar. You're basically a cursor in corporeal form. You're a human cursor. So it still kind of fits. Uh, but I agree. When you push up on these simulation games, you walk through an environment. But the reason these work is because you're not zipping through content. You're stuck at your job upgrading the supermarket. So these are very interesting. Look by look at everything Playway does. They're very big in the simulation genre. 
Management genre is another one that's pretty good. Uh, Cook, Serve, Delicious, a game called Lemon Cake, Dave the Diver. Now, these do, yes, when you move the stick. But again, you're kind of like a cursor. You are picking what upgrades to add to your little bakery. This is cozy. And then here you're managing a business. They're very much like you're managing a business. You pick and upgrade things. That's what these management games are. Very big genre. People on Steam love the genre. Another big one is Auto Battlers. This is one Dwarves Glory Loot, uh, Glory Death and Loot, and then War Pips. These games are basically you use your cursor to buy a bunch of troops, and then you say, go to battle, and then they run to battle, and then you upgrade them, and then all that kind of stuff. Very big genre. Uh, associated with these auto battlers is backpack auto battlers. This is a hot thing where you manage an inventory of upgrades while they auto battle, and you carry in loot and stuff like that, and you manage an inventory. Hot sub 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 genre, very big. Card management games. There's no real term for this. I don't. I just kind of came up with it. I was, it was late, and I decided to decide, call it card management games. This is a very neat sub genre. Basically, it's kind of like an adventure game where you're like, or a uh, an open world survival craft game, but you're just managing cards. There's no graphics. I mean, there's graphics on the cards, but it's not a 3D environment. And basically, you just you you manage the game by placing cards on top of each other. Like if you place a, a settler card on an ore card, that settler is like basically mining ore. You're not controlling it with a stick. You're controlling a cursor about which cards to move around. Really interesting genre. Uh, check these games out. Cultist Simulator, Stacklands, Witch Hand. This is a really great genre for a first-time dev. Very good. Uh, teaches you a lot about Steam. Now... If you say to me, Chris, I really, 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 really want to make a game where you control the main character when I push up on the stick, then my bet is make a horror game. If you have to make a game where you control with control stick, horror game. That's where it's at, okay? When I do this analysis, and it's been the same for two years in a row, basically, the number one genre, the most that breaks through every year is horror games. Steam players freaking love horror games. And I think every single developer who's making an indie game, should sometime in their life make an honest-to-God horror game. Not, not like a dating sim mixed with horror, one of these crazy mix-up. No, you just like, we are straight up going to make a horror game. This is what you should do. Where a monster just chases you. That's what I mean. Horror games are big because you can make them short. The reason you can't make a control stick up moves the character game is because you need so much content. But horror games are so scary. Who wants to play a 40-hour horror game? These people love a horror game that's short. Look at this. It's free and it's fun. Five stars. Fans of horror fan horror games love short horror games. So you, you don't need a huge team with lots of content. You can make a short horror game. Um, the art can be a lot cheaper. <laughs> Rainbow Friends is a very hot horror game. If you ask anybody under the age of 10 about Rainbow Friends, you're gonna hear a whole story. If you've never heard of horror fans, talk to a 10-year-old. Um, and then a 3D platformer like Stray. Look at how the level of graphics you need. This is why 3D platformers are so hard because you are competing against this. Look at the, the level of quality. Whereas if you make a horror game, this is the level of graphics you can make. I'm not dissing on Rainbow Friends, but you can get away with a lot cheaper graphics when you make a horror game. For some reason, I don't know why, okay? Um, here's Zucosis. This is a uh, horror game that has been announced. It goes viral. Horror games go viral because they're so like funny, creepy people are like, you got to see this. And they sport it to all their friends. Basically, in a week, this game made 100,000 wish lists just by having a trailer, okay? That was like, here's a creepy zoo creature. 100,000 wish lists just showed up the next day. Um, Don't Scream is another horror game where you can't scream. Within two weeks, they got 130 wish lists. People love to forward horror games to their friends. It is so easy to market a good horror game. It just, I'm telling you, if you are tired of like, Grinding on marketing, make a horror game. A real honest to God monster chases you horror game, okay? And this has always been the case for indie cinema, indie anything. Horror is what sells. I, I don't know if you know this, but um, Miramax is the arty, you know, they make artsy, fartsy movies, you know, real, what people think of indie stuff. But really, they never really made much money. They really didn't. They founded their studio. They had a horror side. They made indie horror. These indie horror movies is the same company. They just made a branch called Dimension. They made indie horror cinema, cinema that made so much money. And this funded this. So if you want to make like a deep, 
you know, authentic indie game, capital I indie, that's your dreams. It's going to be a 2D platformer where people move the stick and control it. Probably you'll, you know, you're probably not going to make much money. So make a horror game to make a lot of money to fund your dream indie experience. Okay. This is, this is as long as it's happened. It, it's always kind of worked this way. <laughs> These, the, the horror games have funded indie art, capital A art indie, which don't get me wrong. I love it. I love indie art. I love this movie. Okay. But let's be real. I want, I, I don't want you to have to go get a job at EA or something. I want you to keep making indie games. So make a horror game to pay for your dream game. All right. Uh, so that's it. That's my talk. That's how to do genre on Steam. Um, if you still want to hear more, how to market a game.com slash free newsletter comes out every week. I tell a story of something good, something bad happening in the indie world, how to do it. Get a free book, 60 mistakes people make. And then remember, if you still are not tired of me, uh, I'm doing that conference all this week. It goes for the next, it's live. Like it's, it's a live conference. Like you are interacting with me. You can ask me questions. I'm interviewing developers and marketers who are doing interesting marketing on steam. Um, so this is how you do it. And because you all are cool and I love Hamburg, um, XP boost is the, um, is the coupon code for you to kick 10 us dollars off the price. So head on over to there and then enter that coupon code when you check out and, uh, I'll kick it off, but I am ready for some questions. Uh, I'm ready for you all to tell me how wrong I am about uh, the control stick <laughs> issue. It's, it's still my, it's still, it's still a work in progress. It's still a thing, but really this is uh this is risky. This is risky. So anyway, give me the questions. I'm here for y'all. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Chris. So much uh, awesome input. And uh, yeah, personally, I'm going to think a lot about this uh, theory about the controlling the main character. Uh, I'm playing a lot of Rogue Like Deck Builder, so I'm uh, confirming. <laughs> but yeah, I really have to go through my Steam library and um, see if I, um, I confirm it for the rest. Um, uh, somebody in the chat just said, I love hamburgers too. Um, if you're from Hamburg I'm, uh, and into Mexican food, let's talk about tacos because my favorite place just had to shut down. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, on the chat, please, if you have any questions to uh, Chris, please post them now. There's been a lot of interesting comments during your talk. Um, somebody is now planning to develop a simulator where you are a steam market consultant. Very much looking forward to this one. Um, uh, Chris, you, you were talking about a lot about uh, genre expectations, and uh, you mentioned Søren Lundgaard, who uh, played actual 30 games in the genre um, to do some research. Um, uh, indies, uh, of course, do not have the same resources. They maybe can buy 30 games, uh, maybe not even this, and they may also not have uh, the time. Do you think it makes sense to say to indies um, that they should develop games just in genres that they actually like themselves and where they have a certain expertise already. Well, uh, I mean, games are expensive to make. So if you can't afford 30 games to play, you won't be able to afford making a, a game. I mean, it just, I, I know it's hard to say, but um, I, I come from this, uh, from a business perspective, like uh, making a, like, you know, like uh, making a business out of this. So I understand there might be times where it's like you can't afford it, but um, I mean, there's a couple things. One, you know, you can get them on sale. Hey, maybe uh, talk to the developer, see if you do it, maybe pirate it, but then pay the developer once you make your money. It's just very important that you study the market and actually try these games. Um, if you have a business, which you should, a business account, you, all these are tax deductible. You can deduct them off the taxes in, in the U.S. You can deduct business expenses. These are business expenses. You are doing research, um, and this is important. Like if this is one of the most important things you you can do when you make your game. Like ninety percent, like I said, ninety percent of your success is going to be based off the game that you make. So this is a critical step. You need to learn the genre, even if it's a genre that you like. Play all the indie games that are trying that same genre. Try the losers, try the winners, try the ones that have kind of like a moderate success. Document it. This is the most important thing that if you don't do this right and you don't learn what that genre is, you're going to, you know, the, the chances of you succeeding are much lower. So really see what you can do. I mean, there are games pass where you pay once and you get all these games. 
um, add all these to your wish list, buy them when they're on sale. Maybe even message the developer, say, I like your game. Can I get it for free? I mean, don't do that. But if you're really hard up, but really this is, this is investing in a game that you're going to be investing a lot in. So it is a critical step. And I'm literally telling you, go play some video games. What did your mom always say? Stop with those video games. Well, <laughs> tell your mom, Chris Zukowski telling you to play some more video games. So, um, and the reason I say try these genres is you might find out there's actually a genre you didn't know about and it's your new favorite genre. So uh, that's why I say open your heart, try a bunch of games, have fun, play video games. So that's kind of my message, I guess. Um, I like that a lot. Um, also about a uh, question that goes into very practical um, advice. Um, do you have any tools that you can um, recommend on uh, to find the right genre? Yep. Uh, what I like to do is I like VG Insights. V, it's vginsights.com. Um, and what you can do, so here's the thing about Steam. This is what's so hard about Steam is Steam only promotes games that have succeeded. It really does. So you, I know people are like, oh, there's 14,000 games on Steam uh, that released last year. You'll never see 95% of those games. You just won't. They just, Steam smothers them. And it's important to study those games. And you can't find those games if you're just browsing around, clicking around on Steam. So I like a site called VG Insights. And you can filter based on year. And you can filter based off of tag to figure out um, what these genres are. Okay. And so, um, when you do that, that's how I like to do it. And then I look for a game that's sold a lot. Everybody does that. Cause they're like, Oh, I want to be the next, this game, but don't just stop there. Play the game that met the middle, the median, whatever the median is for your genre, then do the tags and the games filter for the games that didn't sell very well. Okay. Um, steam DB is kind of a good one. It's harder to filter based off of tags on steam DB. And then there's, that's a big one. VG. I like VG insights the best. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, we also have a question is procedurally generated content popular on steam since it can be replayed a lot. It can. Uh, yes. Procedural content is very popular. See the whole thing with steam is steam players let me see if I even have that slide. Sorry if I'm going to go through. I forgot to mention it, but there's, um, let me flip through. Um, there was, there's a review. Um, see procedural people like long games on Steam. They just do. I know we are like, Oh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't value a game based on it. How long it is. Steam players do. And then we, I, I know we can complain about it and we can say that's wrong from an artistic standpoint. And I kind of agree. So short experiences are good, but developers, we are not the audience. A lot of developers say, well, I don't have time to play a lot of games. I'm a developer. Let me tell you, people on Steam have a lot of time. And we are the toy makers that fill their time. And they want a lot of content. Um, here it is. Yeah, too short. This is a, I don't know. I guess I flipped through this one too fast. Um, look at this review. He's like, I completed in five hours. Too short. Down vote. Five hours? <laughs> I don't have five hours. But this guy is like, come on, it's just five hours. Steam players love long games. They just do. They just do. I know we can we can debate it and we can say, oh, that's wrong. But that's what they are. And so um, procedural content is key. And a lot of these games that do well, these buildy, crafty, simulation-y games, they build their content because what you're adding, the new content that you add is like you add a new building or a new block in the meta game around that changes based on the interactions with all these things. And that's why I'm trying to teach people. These are the genres that do well are these crafty building simulations. And once you play a bunch of these, you're like, Oh yeah, I totally get it. That's how content works. And um, this is also another reason it's very hard to do procedural content when you're making a game where you push up and the character moves. It is. I mean, I know Spelunky too. Don't I know? I know Spelunky. Um, and those are oh, work okay, the roguelikes, but um, you also fall on the janky side sometimes. It's really hard to make it not janky when you're making those type of games. But anyway, that's a digression. But yes, procedural content is pretty much a must when it comes to Steam or these kind of strategy games where it's light procedural content. But yes, games just have to be long on Steam. That's the way players like it. 
And um, uh, you crunched a lot of numbers uh, from BT Insight and other sources uh, to make also these charts, which genres uh, work really, really well. But of course, they, by, de defin uh, by definition, uh, always um, kind of retrospect. So um, what would you say how... Um, how long can I rely <laughs> on on uh, such a view on the market? Because it always changes. There was a time when 2D pixel art platformers sold really well, <laughs> um, but they are over. And um, yeah, what would you say um, how long the cycles are until uh, genre trends change? I don't know. And it depends on the genre. I mm -hmm. I know it seems like they change a lot. They don't actually change a lot. They, I don't even think, here's the thing. I don't think 2D platformers actually ever did that well. And I know Braid. I know all those ones. But you have to remember, Braid was published by Microsoft. And so they were able, they had tons of money. And there was like one game on Xbox at that time when Braid was there. Um, I don't think Steam has ever really been a good place for 2D platforms. Yes, I know about Celeste. I know about those games. Um, but for the most part, 2D platformers have never really done that well on Steam. It's always been these crafty, buildy, simulation games going back in time forever. Like The Sims was released in, what, 99, I think, 1999. There's a game called Paralives that is doing um, basically The Sims in today's tech and everything, and it's doing fantastic Paralives. Um, I don't, if we're looking at crafty, buildy, simulation -y games, I don't think they change as much. They do, the trends do not change as fast as everybody assumes. So if you're making a game now, please don't make a game for three years. If you, this is one of your first games, try for a shorter development time um, and focus on these shorter, the shorter life cycles aren't going to jeopardize you as much. But I really, <laughs> I really don't think the genres change as fast as we assume they do. Um, if it's a good game that's in the crafty, buildy genre, I think you're still going to, you have a better chance. Now, uh, let me caveat a lot of stuff. You can still make a cra uh, a crappy, crafty building stand. I'm not saying you personally. I, I mean, <laughs> in general, if you make, if somebody makes a crafty building game, it can still suck. This is still a risky business, okay? <laughs> um, if you want security, go make business software. That's a lot better <laughs> business model. Um, but it's just, we're talking odds. And the odds of succeeding when you have a, crafty buildy simulation -y game are much higher than if you're trying to make a 2d platformer so that's kind of my take on it <laughs> yeah makes total sense um do we i don't think we have any more questions in the chat right now we do have a couple of comments i think people are uh, following very interested but don't have that many questions so if uh, not another one comes in yet i'd say or questions are just answered <laughs> so uh, thank you so much Chris I hope uh, to all our viewers out there that you enjoyed this episode of our XP Boost series um, if you did we have a couple of more episodes uh, right here on our YouTube, YouTube channel you can of course also head over to our social media to our discord and um, subscribe to our newsletter to always um, be the first to know about new events that we have and also if you like chris's talk uh, as i mentioned we had this headed in our games lift incubator program first and the application phase for the next incubator year will start in just a few weeks in the beginning of may and i would recommend you to join us for another event we have an online event um this time cassia karen uh, who is a great advisor will give insights on market analysis i will post the link to the event in the chat soon but for today i'd say Thank you so much, Chris. Go over to How to Market a Game. If you'd like to attend his conference, uh, you know where to find the uh, code. Thanks so much, Chris, for sharing that. And to everyone, uh, have a good evening. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you so Bye. much. I appreciate it.